Thank you, Dennis. I think Congressman Lopsack had a good idea of picking the mic up, so I'm going to do that if you can hear me. Before he gets out of here, I want to thank him as the parent of two college students. And they are telling me about student loans, and we're working through it as a family. Their financial aid this year was better because of you, and it'll be better next year because of you. And thank you from a parent. As Dennis said, my name is Tom Feagan. I'm from Clarence, Iowa, or as those of us in Cedar County say, Greater Johnson County. <laughs> I still do all of my doctoring in Iowa City, get my hair cut at stands in Iowa City, and I feel like I'm home. When I was driving in today, I was struck by the fact that Hills Bank is across the street, and while I was in law school, I volunteered two nights a week at the first farm aid clinic in the world run by Joanne Nugel right next to Hills Bank that counsel distressed farmers. And I did that two nights a week in 86, 87, and 88. And it brought it home when I was driving back down Main Street in Hills. What I'd like to do this, this afternoon is I'd like to tell you three things about me. And I've got to say, a lot of you know me and a lot of you helped me when I was in the State Senate. And I want to throw a shout out to Joe Balcom and Bob Dvorsky. I served with them. Thank you for their leadership. I want to pick up what Senator Balcom's doing in terms of payday loans when I get to the Senate. But thank you for that leadership. Thank you for letting me come back to Johnson County. I feel like I'm home. I'd like to tell you three things about me that you may not know. And then I want to talk about some of the challenges that we're facing. And these are challenges that you've heard, but I want to kind of catalog them for you. And then I want to talk about the things that I would like to do as your next US Senator to address those challenges. But first, three things about me. The first is I'm the oldest of 11 children. OK, we didn't have a lot of money on our farm, but we always had plenty to eat. And we played a lot of sports. When you got 11 kids, you've got your own teams. And our sport was basketball. We had a hoop in the barn, and we had a hoop on the side of the machine shed. And I was, being the oldest, always paired with the little kids against the middle kids. So if you can imagine me passing a basketball to a little sister who's six or a little brother at five and saying to him, hang on to it. Don't let the big kids take it away. That taught me a couple of lessons. The first one is play hard and play fair, even if you're not always likely to win. We won enough to keep it interesting, but at the end of the day, you knew the middle kids were better. It also taught me to take care of your vulnerable teammates. And that's a lesson that's carried over into my adult life. Because of my volunteering at the farm aid clinic, I became a bankruptcy lawyer. And today, and for the last 21 years, I've been paired with some of our most vulnerable Iowa businesses, homeowners, and farmers. And that lesson of protecting my vulnerable teammates has carried over to my adult life. The second thing I would tell you about me is I do know how to work hard. On our farm, we raise 300 head of cattle and about 1,000 head of hogs a year by hand. My dad didn't discover electricity until I left. <laughs> Funny how that works. We used a tying scoop, a scoop shovel, and a two bushel basket. And when you feed that many livestock every day by hand, you learn what it means to be reliable, to be persistent, and appreciate a job well done. You know, you learn on the farm that if they don't eat, you don't eat. And you also learn persistence that when you fall down in the mud, you got to get back up and you got to keep feeding them until they're fed. And you appreciate the value of a job well done. At the end of the day, when your livestock are bedded and they're dry and they're fed, you said, that was a good day's work. The third thing I would tell you about myself is I always have a plan B. When I was in high school, I was going to farm. And I actually had the nickname Farmer Fegan. And I started to farm out of high school, and along came 21% interest rates in Paul Volcker, and it wasn't possible for me to stay on the farm. And my plan B was to go to law school and help farmers. That's a lesson that's still carried over to my adult life. Right now, every day, small businesses, farmers, homeowners are coming into my office and saying, I can't pay the mortgage. I can't pay the bills. Yesterday, I had a painting and drywall contractor come in, 40 years of experience, 40 years of being in business in the corridor. He has no work, no jobs lined up between now and January 1. He only has one job, 
that he's got lined up for January. And we're talking, what's plan B? How do we keep the doors open? How do we keep our employees? And I've got to tell you, the last year, year and a half, it's gotten a lot tougher. It might be plan C or plan D or plan E or even plan F. And that's the reason that I got into this race, because while I'm seeing small businesses in the corridor and in eastern Iowa hurting, this guy from New Hartford, who's been keeping the seat warm for 30 years, says it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And I say to him, buddy, who are you talking to? They're not the Iowans I'm talking to. They're not the Iowans that I'm representing and trying to keep alive until this recession ends. And with that, let's talk about some of those challenges that we're facing. And you hear the numbers. Let me just kind of catalog them for you. This last week, 531,000 of our fellow Americans lined up for unemployment for the first time. That's 15,000 more than the week before. There's 15 million 100,000 Americans who want to work, who are actively looking for work and can't find work. Our factories are at two-thirds of capacity. If you look at the number of new homes being constructed in September of 2009, it's only two-thirds of what it was a year ago. Last night, the FDIC closed seven banks. That brings the total of banks that have failed this year in America to 106. And banks aren't loaning money. If you've tried to borrow money for your small business, you know they're not loaning money. As a bankruptcy lawyer, I always have a list of banks that I can take people to if they want to get a divorce from their other bank. There's nobody on my list this year. At the same time, Wall Street's still a mess. That said, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs both reported over $3 billion, over $3 billion each, almost $6.5 billion in profits for the third quarter, July, August, and September. Now, all of that, or most of that, was made speculating on American products. And I've got to say, from my perspective, it's immoral that a pirate on Wall Street makes more speculating on the product than the American worker made who made that product. While we're trying to find the end to this recession, we've got the health care problem. And Bob talked about it. Congressman Loebsack talked about it. There's a reported number that's going to come out at the end of this month that we actually now have 50 million Americans who do not have health insurance because of layoffs, loss of income, loss of jobs. 50 million of our fellow citizens. Then there's the rest of us, and I include myself in this category, who have to use a technical term, crappy insurance. You know what I'm talking about. High deductibles, high co-pays, lots of exclusions. It was my birthday this month, and we had to renew my policy. And my insurance guy said, Tom, they're going to exclude your back. And I'll tell you, I've had back problems in my life. It's one of the reasons why it's easier being a lawyer than a, something else. And my back's not covered. If anything happens to me the next year, I'm paying for it. My insurance company won't cover my back. While we're dealing with that issue, health care costs the last 10 years, have gone up twice as fast as inflation, twice as fast. But it gets better. In 2009, through the end of September, we've had 2% inflation in this country. Healthcare costs have increased 10.5%, 10.5%, five times as fast as inflation. At that rate, in seven years, we will be paying twice what we are today for the same procedure, the same care. And it's literally killing our small businesses. When Chrysler filed bankruptcy, they declared that it cost them $1,000 per car to provide coverage to their employees and their retirees. And what do you hear out of Washington from the other side? <laughs> yeah. yeah, nothing, nothing. 